I'm Meg Whalen, Director of Communications for the College of Arts and Architecture, and today we have two of our art faculty here to tell us about exhibitions that opened this week in row galleries, and they will be open through January 28th. We have David Brodeur, whose exhibition is upstairs in the row galleries, Semiotics, no, Semantics. Now, which comes first? Semantics, semiotics, semiotics, semantics, and the Second Amendment. I can't right. remember which word comes first. That's fine. <laughs> and then downstairs in the row galleries, Tom Schmidt, we have Data Mine. That's right. And um, they're very different shows and really interesting work in both exhibitions. And so I wanted to give the two of you an opportunity to tell people a little bit about the work about the ideas behind the work um, and, and give them hints what to look at up close when they go to see these exhibitions. So um, I actually have pictures that I took so they're not that great <laughs> but they're okay um, and I want people to be able to see the pictures as we talk. So we're going to start, uh, Dave, with <coughs> your uh, pieces that are upstairs in row galleries and I thought that this wall text got at the beginning of the title of your exhibition, right? the semiotics and semantics part, right. or vice versa. Right. Um, and so I thought maybe you could explain a little bit about that and about the title of the exhibition. Sure. Um, so the piece obviously is, is the text from the Second Amendment and um, the idea here is that most of the debate about gun violence in our country and um, personal rights versus sort of the collective um, comes keeps coming back to the Second Amendment. And a lot of that has to do with the grammar of the Second Amendment and uh, what uh, the Founding Fathers' original intent was. And um, a lot of that has to do with the placement of a few commas and a few capital letters. and. When you um, go back and do a little research, you find that it changed between the um, first signed copy of the Constitution and then what was transcribed into the House of Representatives um, journal. And um, it's not exactly clear how that changed, but it really kind of changes the meaning, gives, changes the emphasis from the militia to the people and the whole meaning behind it. And part of my point is um, maybe the conversation should be about more than just the grammar of that sentence, that it's, it's kind of um, not ironic, but um, um, it's not really the whole picture and we should be looking more at uh, kind of what we want to be moving forward rather than what the intent was back then. Um, so by just sort of illustrating and putting marks the way a teacher would on a paper right. um, uh, that somebody made those changes, um, whether it was intentional or a mistake of somebody simply scribing the, the translation into this book. Um, but uh, it, it's just meant to draw attention to the fact that maybe the conversation needs to be bigger than just the semantics of this um, uh, 200 plus year old sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was the intent of that piece. Right, and of course that you with this exhibition you really are opening up that conversation mm -hmm. in a, a really, um, I mean in a way that I think goes past the intellectual. I mean this, this right here is an intellectual exercise where we can look at how changes, grammatical changes, do change the meaning and the intent and the possibility of interpretation. Mm -hmm. But then also the work as art does kind of even goes beyond that and, and starts to impress upon us in an in almost physical as well as emotional way kind of this whole discussion. Um, so tell us a little bit, tell us uh, a little bit about what this image is here from mm -hmm. the hallway, but mm -hmm. also kind of how you came to the decision to do this show at all. Oh, um, well, it's, it, you know, it, 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 growing up as a, 
as a, I mean, I go all the way back to uh, growing up as a kid and having an interest in war movies and, and playing war. You know, I was that kid who play in the woods and, and play capture the flag and we didn't have sort of um, uh, paintball then or any of those mm -hmm. kind of uh, simulation. It was just kids with sticks in the woods, you know, it kind of started there and plastic models and then World War II history and the history of, of sort of weapons and warfare. It's just always been this sort of sub-interest of mine. So I happen to know a lot about this stuff. But simultaneously, this sort of, this I reached a point where um, seeing violence in, in both in real things, real life events mixed with tired of seeing it on TV and, and having children really had a big part to do with it. And um, Sandy Hook really in Newtown, Connecticut really was the final straw. My daughter was in first grade, the same grade as most of the children. My father still lives in Connecticut, the same county. Oh, um, friends who were teachers all over the state. We went to school together. Uh, so there's this connection to that place. Um, so I s sort of said, okay, I got to make some work about it as some cath catharsis. So um, this particular piece, um, the idea here is playing off of Rene Magritte's This Is Not a Pipe. Um, and uh, this is, and the, the timing is such that it kind of coincides with what just happened with in Paris. But um, the uh, idea here is that uh, <coughs> this is not an assault rifle. And um, so w what I was thinking about there was sort of the 1994 um, assault weapons ban and the attempt by the legislature to um, define which weapons were legal and which were not by certain characteristics. Um, and it came, a lot of it came down to this well as an automatic or semi-automatic. And so um, the other part of this piece is the bullets and their, their actual live rounds. I, I checked with campus police and the lawyer to make sure it was okay to have live rounds on campus. But um, so it's two sets of the same ammunition and um, whether it's being fired semi-automatic or automatic doesn't matter. It's the same ammunition. It has its intent was designed in Russia in 1947 to um, kill people on the battlefield at a, at a intermediate range. So if somebody walks in with um, a magazine full of 30 of these rounds and an AK-47 that it's going to be devastating. So um, yeah. just the you know, Magritte was playing with this paradox. It's not, it's, um, this is not a pipe. Yes, it's, it's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. And his, his answer was often, well, can you put, can you put tobacco in it? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Well, and so I'm playing off that and say, well, can you put this ammunition in it? So it's not really, it's not really an AK-47. It's a photograph of an AK-47. Um, but it's, again, it's referencing that 94 assault weapons ban and sort of the, um, the, the poor attempt at sort of categorizing by characteristics right. versus, say, looking at the whole, which is what's, what's the design and the intent of having this. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, an, an assault rifle, the point of an assault rifle is an offensive weapon. It's not a defensive. It's not about self-defense. It's about offense. So um, that's sort of my point of that piece is that... Um, well, and that goes back to language too, in a right. way. I mm -hmm. mean, it goes back to the, to the title of the exhibition. I right. mean, you know, what are you calling this, and then what really is it, and then how are you, categorizing and defining and right. all of that. So, right. yeah, it's very interesting. Here are a few um, pieces. I encourage people to go up to the hallway in a row and get a a good look of these head on and really, um, see them, and tell us a little bit about the images and the text on each panel. Sure, uh, these are large-scale drawings. They're about 40 by 60. I hadn't, I haven't done some drawing in a while, so I really wanted to get back to um, working, working directly. Um, but the intent with the in images, again, was to sort of present these um, in, a, in a grand uh, scale. Um, and, and mix them up with some different symbology to give them uh, different meanings. So here comes the semiotics part of the title. Um, so I picked different um, uh, firearms that are associated with different sort of 
famous or infamous points in, in, in history or violence in our country. So there's the, um, the assault rifle that was used in um, Sandy Hook and the, as well as the Beltway sniper, um, the, the Derringer that was used to kill Lincoln, and then the, um, the, the Glock pistol that was used in the Virginia Tech massacre. Um, and then playing around with some text, um, the first one was the, the Ecce Homicidium, which is a, a reference to a traditional Christian um, right. theme from the Passion of the Christ when he was presented to the angry crowd and they were putting the thorn of crowns on his head. Um, and uh, Ecce Homo uh, means um, behold the man, um, and it was a mocking of Christ in his claim to divinity. Um, so I'm taking that thorny crown and putting it over the over the pistol and sort of asking uh, from one perspective the um, one side of this argument might say um, you know it's our divine right to protect ourselves this pistol the semiotic pistol is sort of the perfect weapon um, to, for defensive purposes um, where the other side might look at that crown as, as ironic or mocking as the way um, Christ's tormentors were looking at it. So right. um, just depending on which side of the argument you're on, you might look at that symbology in a different way and maybe until you read the title <laughs> when it's, I've trained, it changed Ecce Homo to Ecce Homicidium, meaning right. uh, the man killer, right. behold the man killer. So. Yeah. So if we go into the room off of that hallway, there are two opposing walls. So this is one wall, and then on the opposite, there is this wall. So you have to actually be in the space to get a sense of the um, intensity of those two things together. Tell us first about these projections that are on the wall. Sure. Um, these were a collection um, over a relatively small period of time, about a, about a month. Um, I worked, collaborated with another artist. His name is David Schof. Um, a recent alumni of UNC Charlotte, um, and we, a lot of it was drawing from memory of scenes that um, in movies and TV shows, or um, I haven't played video games in a long time, but um, that had an impact on us um, uh, in terms of standing out of, of kind of, not disturbing, but stayed with us, images mm -hmm. from movies and, and that stayed with us. And then on the other side is a collection of um, news reports about shootings. And again, it started with the ones that I remember distinctly happening, um, you know, going all the way back to the McDonald's massacre mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the 80s and then Columbine in the 90s and, um, um, and just playing this, the idea that um, each reel is playing continuous and there's short editing in them and some are played longer, some play shorter. Um, but that this sort of everyday news never ends, that every night um, there's, there's a report of another shooting somewhere, um, and which connects to, to the, the wall, the other wall in the, in the gallery. Um, but then on, um, just back to the video for a second, the other side is, are these cuts, short cuts, sometimes um, continuous cuts from movies of, of violence being depicted, and then there's the overlapping where what they're talking about on the on the in the news is happening in the movie, and sometimes there's the weird um, juxtaposition of, uh, of real life or reality and fantasy crossing over and blurring the line in between the two. And uh, my point here is that um, kind of over time, we're we're constantly seeing either whether it's in the news or movies or television, um, video games. Um, the, the, the level of violence in, in all of those media are being pushed, um, sort of the splatter factor is mm -hmm. constantly upped. Um, and there's, there's even TV commercials and movies going all the way back to the 50s and 60s, right. and this is not a new thing. Gun violence being depicted on TV, even as something as um, benign as the Andy Griffith show, there was a running joke of Barney mm -hmm. having not being right. able to have bullets in his gun because he was always going off by accident. and 
But you juxtapose that against a wall full of how many people are shot every day. Right, which um, is what this in is. A, in a gun accident, right. Um, so each card is a target of me in a different colored t-shirt to help yeah, differentiate. Yeah, there's a close-up so people um, can see. And each card sort of designates one person. So um, every day is 200 and on average, and this data comes from the Brady campaign. Um, so every day, um, 296 people on average are, are shot for uh, in a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the, the biggest number of people, 88 of those people die, and the biggest number of deaths comes from suicide because the, the success rate with suicide with handguns right. is, is the right. highest, and then the second is homicide, homicide and then the, the third is accidents or unintentional. So, you know, Barney Fife's joke, the party, Barney Fife joke is funny until you see that every day um, dozens of people are shot by accident. Um, you know, a recent event, the woman in Idaho, right. uh, a two-year-old, um, you know, uh, a, a, <clears throat> a mistake, a, you know, from a, um, a silly or stupid mistake. Um, so. Um, I'm just trying to get, again, um, my goal is, you know, I don't know how many minds I'm going to change with this information or, but maybe, um, maybe the, the kid who, who's playing the splatter video game uh, thinks, well, you know what, why next time I buy, you know, Grand Theft Auto f version, whatever, um, and it's even more violent, why, why do I need to get the more violent? Is it because I'm becoming desensitized? It's, it's no longer funny or it's no longer fun because the splatter no longer has effect on me. And so um, I just think as a culture, um, we're sort of um, callousing or uh, becoming desensitized to um, this constant droning of everyday violence in, in um, all the media that we consume that um, uh, it, it, it's, const it's got to always be one, uh, it's, the ante has to be upped each time. Um, I also noticed a few other um, weird coincidences or, um, or just um, evidence of this idea. For example, there's a long footage of the um, live footage of the sniper um, in Austin, Texas, at the University of Texas, back in 1966, when he was he was shooting um, students, and um, they had live news news coverage, um, and that's running. And next to it is is scenes from a made-for-TV movie called um, The Bloody Tower, which was, um, came out about nine years after. Um, and that's, that's pretty impactful to, to see those two things together. But then um, you also see the Beltway Sniper, which is more recent. And um, the last victim of the Beltway Sniper was sometime in October. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the year right now. but um, And uh, within a year, less than a year, almost to the day, a made-for-TV movie mm -hmm. came out. Um, so, you know, that was 1966 to 1975 was the difference then, but now that means somebody probably signed the rights to the TV movie within a few right. months or weeks after it, after it happened. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's something strange about, um, you know, we just lived through it, why do we need to see it again right. um, that quickly? Um, and you know, I don't. I don't think those dramas necessarily um, take a stance on wh whether uh, you know should this uh, this guy have had access to an assault. Again, it was an assault rifle. Um, should this person have had access? There's no never any kind of question right. like that raised. And it's it's just this almost a uh, a dramatized. Uh, retelling of of that story as if it needed to be more more dramatic um, than than the real life story good well thank you for sure. telling us about this work and again i hope people will go see it it's up let's see today is the 15th so a little less than two weeks and i think the two of you will be talking on wednesday mm -hmm. um, this coming wednesday at 12 30 to ask 
or answer questions and, yep. and things in the galleries. Mm -hmm. There, Tom, I want to move downstairs into row galleries and um, and talk a little bit about your work. It's very different work, uh, but you know, one thing that art always does is it tries to get us to be aware in a different way of something. And and Dave, your work is asking us to be aware of this gun culture and how we're behaving and thinking and feeling about it. And and Tom, your work acts, asks us to be aware too of kind of the digital world that's coming in yes. and how it's affecting the, the physical of the art world yes. and, and to pay attention to different structures and surfaces and, and all of that. So tell us a little bit about your exhibition. Okay. So yeah, it, it definitely attempts to bring awareness to materiality and our own perception of objects, but also um, I'm trying to look a little bit at ceramics history and I see it as a pretty interesting kind of character if you want to put it that way in which there's so many there's such a varied history to it um, this became particularly um, clear and, and poignant for me when I was living in Beijing where I was teaching ceramic design for four years which was the the job I had before I came here to UNCC and I was just blown away both by this powerful um, traditional ceramic ware that was being made there, like Qinghua, the sort of blue and white mm -hmm. iconic floral ceramics that you see, um, but also a lot of the industrial ceramics that I had never really seen close up before. So there's a ton of, of uh, like filters and insulator parts and computer chips and this whole other industrial aspect right. to ceramics. Um, and then most recently, I've been ex exploring 3D printing and digital modeling technologies. So I think my show is, is in a way asking questions about this medium and what it reflects about globalization and new digital technologies. Um, and in some ways, it's purposefully an overwhelming array of objects. I kind of want it to be somewhat ambiguous because I don't think, I think that in fact, uh, ceramics is at a, sort of is in the kind of identity crisis mm -hmm. right now where there's people making functional pottery but there's also people exploring objects which their hand is completely removed from the production of the object so that right. brings about a lot of questions oh yeah it's all it's so it's such an identity disruption that's right because yeah. you think the very thing you think of with ceramics is hands i mean that's you right. really think of the hands being part of it in the that tactile experience yes. and feeling that clay and then to think yeah. of a 3D printer creating something that yeah, was designed right. on a computer screen or whatever. Yeah. So it is, it's it's really a different, whole different world. Um, here gives you kind of a, a view of the gallery from a distance and you can mm -hmm. see some things. I want to zoom in to one piece here. Um, so tell us about what what's going on here. We have kind of a we have a two D thing and we have a three D thing. Yes. So this is an example of this kind of staged, um, you know, combination of of pieces. Um, so on the left is a three D print. Um, this is a a study of a of a Voronoi structure, and this is um, in collaboration with an architecture student named Stephen Danilowitz, mm -hmm. who's uh, he's graduating actually this semester. And he and I had some overlapping interests. Um, and one of them was this particular um, algorithm in which, um, see if I can explain it in less than five, in less than a minute, but it's <laughs> essentially you can create an array of points in space. And using the software, um, you can create planes which, which are um, avoiding these points. So it's almost like a negative charge. So, to me, it's a really um, incredible way of, of actually looking closely into what is, exists in a lot of biological, like cellular structures, crystalline structures. Um, and the piece um, in the middle is actually a, a drawing, a scribble that I had done when I was in Beijing, which was actually um, more exploring value to, to study this, a similar kind of structure before I knew um, mathematically how to how, create that. Yeah. And, and then finally on the right is, is a plotter print which is also a digitally produced um, image from, from the 3D model. So it's kind of juxtaposing the gestural handmade with, with the digitally produced as, right. as a way to explore form. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't, 
Of course, now that you mention it, I see that it's a hand-drawn versus, but, yeah. um, and the 3D piece, the, the little sculptural piece is actually really beautiful. You can't tell in this picture, so people have to go see it up close, yeah. but it's really, it's actually quite lovely. Mm -hmm. um, tell me how this was made. I just think this is so interesting. Okay. So this is, um, when, I, when I was studying ceramics um, in, um, this is actually right before I got into grad school, I was, had just learned um, slip casting, which is a ceramics technique that was originally developed for industry so you could mass produce objects like this. Right. So you could just form one model, you know, make a, make a mold, mold, and then yeah. cast liquid clay into it. Right. And the, the moisture from from the clay, the water content gets drawn into the plaster and it forms a skin, at which point you pour out the excess slip. But it, one time I think it was probably accidental where, you know, if you have a few moles going at once, it's easy to lose track of one of them. And I think it probably settled for, for more than that 20 minutes. And I began to see how it was starting to sink in on itself. So this, this block was actually left to settle over the course of probably three or four weeks. And every day I came into the studio, I would see that sort of recording of time that had happened as those little wrinkles that formed as it was descending into the mold. And then in the fire, it underwent another kind of stress, which was the expansion and contraction that happens naturally through the, the firing process. So this is an object where, like digitally produced objects, in fact, I just kind of set up a scenario and let the material um, do its thing. So I, I just sort of set the the stage for that to happen and it to me it it really captures this kind of geologic event um, which I, I thought was really quite astounding that within just a, a few weeks you know you can capture all of this turbulence and tension and then right. freeze it into a, into an object so that was the first attempt at, at that kind of work for me yeah it's really fascinating and then this is a piece that's so radically different. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's really beautiful. I love it. Tell us about um, this. So these are um, related to some of the prints. Um, and I was trying to, to think about um, kind of volume within a skin. So uh, these are actually quite thinly cast. Um, and I have some, some cor corresponding prints in the exhibition, which are printed into acetate. So they're they're translucent and um, the imagery is also comes from from drawings and photographs of mm -hmm. ink so I'm trying to think about the two-dimensional printed plane in relation to to actual like you know porcelain and, and you know this kind of material that has a more tactility mm -hmm. to it so juxtaposing these these flat and dimensional objects um, so this was an exploration that evolved into a lot of, of these casts. And in some cases, I would sandblast and actually disintegrate them until there was almost nothing left. So it's, it's a little bit about entropy and decay and um, trying to, to push the limits of how far you can, can remove material and still maintain uh, form. And then I don't have a picture, but you do have um, on one wall a video running um, from China, I guess, yeah. right, from when you were there. Tell us a little bit about what that is, and then yeah. people can go and, and watch that. Okay. So <clears throat> a lot of the work in this show is actually collaborative, um, or a few pieces, I should say. And that video um, is from a collaboration with, with a friend named Jeffrey Miller, who's, who I worked with in Beijing and still lives there. And he and I would take discarded ceramics from various factory sites in China and we would also, um, we found a site that had recycled aluminum and um, we essentially developed a process where we could cast this aluminum into the shards to produce um, artwork, design objects, and uh, architectural tile. So this is a project that's still going and um, we're trying to develop various ways of, of using waste towards creating new, new art objects. Great, yeah. that's interesting. So um, again, oh, I wanted to bring this slide back up so people can see, see the dates. Um, so up through January 28th, and 
next Wednesday the 21st at 1230 in the galleries you'll be there to talk about the work mm -hmm. and if people have questions they can come and and ask you right to yep. ask questions Absolutely. And, um, so thank you both for being here thank you for the thoughtfulness that goes into the work that you both do and for sharing that with our campus and and with the public and we hope you'll tune in next week for another live wire at the same time. Thank you very much.